I'm Marion Kinoshta. I will be your moderator today. And this is my first time moderating anything, so please be kind. So this is the craft of translating books about handicrafts. And our speakers today are Allison Watts and Wendy Uchimura. And Allison is in Ibaraki Prefecture, and Wendy Uchimura is in England. Just moved there half a year ago, maybe? Yeah, March I moved here. March, okay. And I should be upfront and say that I have known Wendy and Allison for many years through the Japan Association of Translators and SWEAT. These are our topics for the day. Self-introductions first, just very quick ones, but to show you what kind of books they've been translating and how they got to where they are. And then the translation process. And then a few tricky sentences and terms. And then working with publishers, maybe a few hints for people who are interested in getting into translating about crafts and representing the authors. And then we'll have a little break after that, assuming time goes smoothly. And then we'll start in with the Q&A. <clears throat> so we'll start with Wendy. As I said, I know I've known Wendy for a while. In fact, she advised me about how to start creating an online presence. I am on Facebook and Instagram so far, but that's as far as I got. She's probably not too proud of me yet, but I'll start working on it more. She'll tell you about all that she translates, but to be honest, when I think of Wendy, this is what I think of. <laughs> <laughs> there is, this is a very logical reason about this. Whenever I'm looking at Facebook, and you're looking at Facebook on your iPhone, you often don't see the poster's name, but you see what they're posting. And she posts the weirdest but cutest things. And they either have to do about crafts, about nature, coffee or books those are her four topics so in my image yeah wendy has this very weird but cute image <laughs> now that i've gotten out of the way i will okay. pass it over to you wendy and just tell me when you want me to switch slides okay thank you um, so i'm wendy and i don't have an official company but i work under the name sky translations japan and i've always had a three-prong approach to my translation work. So I separated my fields into three parts. The first main one is legal and that's licensing. I work for a licensing agency. So I get to say that I work with Paddington Bear and Betty Boop and Popeye and as well as quite a few artists and brands. And it's all copyright and trademarks, design, law and yeah, that's an interesting job. And it kind of links in to all my other work. Then my second field is social contribution. So I do a lot of work with uh, NPOs, NGOs for translating websites and articles, things like that. And then my third field is just interest. If I have any spare time apart from the first two, then I was picking up things that I wanted to translate that I was interested in. And that was actually the smallest part of my work to begin with. But over the last five, six years, it's got a lot bigger, but it started off very tiny. So <laughs> tiny. <laughs> so this is the first book that I did to do with handicraft and it's a tiny wardrobe and basically it's making very very small clothes fashionable clothes for your dolls the dolls are about I think 15 centimeters so 24 inches high yeah so that was my first challenge and then things went on to being a little bit more yeah so with this one this was a bilingual book that I did and so there's Japanese and English in there and this is a wazaka is quite an interesting phrase because it comes from zaka and I already knew from my licensing work that zaka is already quite a recognized word in the marketing and brand industry mm -hmm. it comes across as lifestyle items but Kimino-san actually has her own interpretation of what wazaka is. And this book is all about the everyday items that you use, but they have a very deep sense of handicraft. So you can see on the cover, you have the little saucers and they're basically just for dipping your sushi in or for holding tare or soy sauce. But 
there's a very long historical tradition behind how they're created. And then I shifted across from there and went into more the yarn side. I'm originally a knitter and so I've always loved playing with yarn and stuff. And I started with the pom-pom animals, that one, that book came to me and I was really happy to do that. And that interestingly linked across because the Tuttle publisher saw the pom-pom animal books and went, hey, do you want to do a fantastic felted cats book? I'm like, okay, so that went fantastic. And then it went from fantastic to amazing. So we've gone through quite a few crafts already, but now we've gone to origami. So the next one I did was origami oh, with oops, Got sorry, Dinosaurs. Sorry. <laughs> so I got, had a go at a couple of uh, origami books. The origami pets one, particularly Pichimoto san has a very interesting concept on how to go about origami that I might mention later. And more recently, we've gone with modern. And these are my latest two books that have just come out. The modern Japanese painting techniques. If you're familiar with Japanese art, you might recognize on the cover, it's very much the Bijinga style. Stan also is very influenced by Ukiyo-e, but he's brought it into the modern field. And he actually paints with acrylic paints. So he's put a real modern twist onto a very ancient Japanese style. And then something I never thought I would do, because I only started crocheting about five years ago to basically relieve stress, I've actually now translated a crochet book. <laughs> so that was quite interesting to do and it's fun as well. Okay, thank you very much. We'll get into nitty gritty stuff in a minute. First, we want to hear from Alison. And full disclosure about Alison is that I'm kind of one of her I don't know what you call me, a disciple or something, because she's very passionate about Sashiko. And I have even bought her quilts. And that's why I have these little coasters all over my house. You can so they're even spilled with coffee. So they're used a lot. I do know a lot about what Allison does, but I would like to give you a warning that sometimes Allison can't find that thin line between Sashiko and real life. So if we find her getting too deep into like really detailed stitches, we have to like nudge her along onto the next topic. <laughs> but I say that out of, you know, extreme respect actually for somebody who can go so deep into one topic and out of love because I love all the things that you create. Uh, thank you, Marion. And you are pre-warned, <laughs> everybody. Um, so I, I, a, a literary translator, that's my full-time job. I was a commercial translator for many years until 2015, when I decided to change the course of my working life. And I became, a, I called myself a literary translator. And I started trying to make some sort of business from doing Sashiko somehow. But my interest in Sashiko stretched back many decades before that. I've lived in Japan now for, I think, 32 or 33 years, something like that. Too many to count almost. But when I first came to Japan, I started after a couple of years, I got married and my husband is from Miyagi Prefecture up north, Tohuk, and we have a lot of in-laws up there as well. And I did a lot of traveling in Tohuk with my parents-in-law and I started noticing Sashiko. And so before I say more about my journey with Sashiko, I thought <coughs> I should perhaps explain what Sashiko is, things we're going to be talking about it in such depth today. So if you don't mind, I'm going to give you a mini lecture right now. <laughs> so what is okay. Sashiko for those who don't know? So Sashiko originally, it was a method of reusing and strengthening pieces of cloth and fabric and it began amongst I guess you could say the farmers the peasants the working class and it's mainly known as a handicraft a technique that was born in the Tohoku region but it spread all over Japan so originally Sashiko was this borrow which in Japanese means rags and literally in the days before cotton came to Japan that was about 400 years ago hemp was the only source of fiber to make fabric for and whatever fabric there was was so precious it had to be used and used and used over and over and over again so people would take scraps of fabric 
sew them together and add layers. And they would use this to make their clothes, to make their futons, to make everything, pants, nappies, everything in daily life. So that's the origins of Boro. Uh, these photos here are items I saw in an exhibition by a man called Chusaburu Tanaka, who is a folklorist in Aomori Prefecture. He realized the, sort of the value of all these bits of old rags lying around and he started collecting them. And he made this major collection that was kept in the Muse Museum in Tokyo for many years until that museum closed down. And then this collection went on tour overseas. So I think it's still overseas. It's been in the US, it's been to Scandinavia, Europe. I'm hoping it will come back to Japan soon because it's an incredible collection. But anyway, borrow is one of these words that I want to talk about later because it's a tricky word. To me, with my origins as a translator, borrow always meant rags. It's not something that has a very good connotation, but borrow has become extremely popular in English. And when I first sort of noticed this trend for borrow, I thought, what on earth is this? You know, like, who'd want to make smelly old rags? But meanings of words change. So borrow was one type of sashiko. Then you've got another type, which is koginzashi. So koginzashi, this developed in Aomori Prefecture, way up north. Hemp was the, absolutely the only fabric that they had and it's extremely precious. It was limited and there were rules about how much fabric people were allowed to have. I think especially during the shogunate era, like in the 1700s, there were regulations about what kind of fabric, how much you're allowed, you're allowed to buy, allowed to use. If you made a kimono, you're only allowed to have one layer. People weren't allowed to put underlines on their clothes. So you can imagine how cold it would be. This hemp is not a very closely woven fabric and how cold it is. So sashko, this form of stitching developed as a way of making the fabric stronger and warmer. And it's very distinctive because the patterns are all stitched in a horizontal line. You can see because the hemp is like a grid. And so over time, they became more and more ornate and you get lovely items like this, but you'd also see it in farm wear and also ordinary pieces of clothing. So koginzashi, this blue and white one, this was came from the Tsugaru don, domain, which is in the top left hand on the Japan Sea side of Aomori. And on the other side, on the Pacific side, you had another daimyo, you had the Nambu domain. And so in that domain, you've got this different kind of sashiko developed. So next slide, this is Nambu Hishizashi, which is completely different. Well, it's colorful. And the reason for that is because on the Japan, the Pacific side, so eventually the train lines came up and they brought colored fabric and thread. And then also the Nambu daimyo was a bit more lenient than the other daimyo on the Tsugaru side and permitted the use of color. So essentially it's the same style, it's the same technique, but it's got this colorful look. The photo on the left, that's some children's tabby which are absolutely gorgeous. You know, these were made in the Meiji era, but I wouldn't mind wearing them. And then in the center, that's just a piece of, a big piece of stitching for people, farmers, peasants, samurai, who weren't allowed to wear kimonos, didn't have access to all the very prized fabrics. Sashko was one way of kind of replicating those patterns and motifs in their own clothes so they could stitch the colors and they could stitch the same patterns and make their clothing a bit more decorative and beautiful. The right hand side you've got these pants so you can see um, these are so cool you can imagine someone wearing them today. The jacket the hunting has got very finely stitched lines that helps to strengthen it and then you've got the pants which have the Nambu Hishisa patterns and also indigo dye was another <clears throat> another resource that was really limited and so people would stretch out the amount of the dye they had access to and they'd make patterns like this to make it go as far as possible so that's in the far north and then further south you had in the shonai yamagata region a different kind of sashiko developed so this is moyozashi and hitomezashi so in Yamagata and further south, where people had access to cotton as well as hemp, and also there's a trade route 
bringing fabric from further south. And so using the different fabrics meant that they different kinds of patterns developed and they weren't all straight lines and they could be curved or they could be geometric. So on the left, this is my absolute favorite pattern. I can't stop staring at this all the time. It's called Gunze, which means sea urchin. It's a dialect word from a little island called Tobishima in the Japan Sea off Akita, off the coast of Akita. And so the fishermen on Tobishima and not just the fishermen, the women, everybody used to wear clothes with this pattern. And there were other patterns as well that were kind of replicating the seagrass. And this pattern later became quite popular. Its, its name was changed to come on, which sounds a bit fancier, like flower pattern or family crest. So that's one example of moyozashi. And moyozashi is basically like pattern sashiko. You typical like asanoha, the hemp leaf for the waves or all the patterns that we often see around us now in daily life like on packaging or in the rugby world cup or <laughs> in all kinds of places the very really common what we think of as japanese traditional pattern sashi and then to the right there's another kind of sashiko this is called hitome sashi which is basically sashiko that's stitched on a grid and this pattern is called kakinoha which means persimmon flower and there's another whole subset and there's all lots of patterns that are within that subset of hitomizashi and particularly in the shonai region of yamagata hitomizashi was really dominant and lots of the patterns were related to the kinds of tasks they were used for so sashiko was used for example to make packs you know carrying around loads of sacks of rice or whatever and they would use this kind of very fine patterns to make it stronger so yeah daily life so i've got a this is a kind of a grab bag of different types of sashiko jizashi which basically means practical it means ground sashiko which is practical so in the picture on the right hand side you can see like three cloths stitched with geometric the three examples of pitomezashi so these kinds of sashiko that would be used for example reinforcing clothes the underarm of a yukata or a kimono or the crotch of the pants or um side pants or pockets or the kind of tool bags made for putting tools in that's the kinds of patterns that were used and in those days a long time ago before people had books or this those cloths were a means of passing this on from one generation to the next so they're called hanafukin and they're about 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters more or less and whenever a girl was born her mother would start stitching these hanafukin for her and every hanafukin would be a pattern so by the time she was old enough to go out as a bride she would have a collection of these hanafukin to take with her to use as a reference for when she needed to do all the sewing and making all the clothes and things for her family so that's hanafukin have become it's like i guess the templates of old day japan on the left hand side that's an example of moyozashi all the different kinds of moyozashi in there so there's in the middle, you can see the hemp and there's car, uh, basket weave and there's bishamon ten and there's the um, horned tortoise shell and there's a side garter, which is brocade weave or key fret. That kind of style that's called ishiwari and that's this all also developed from the army, farmer samurais in the um, Yamagata area who came up after being defeated down at, oh, I forget the name, that big battle down near Lake Biwa. The historic battle slips from mine but anyway so when they came up to Yamagata and they started living there these kind of cloths were used in the entrances to samurai farmer houses for people to wipe their feet on or <laughs> wipe their hands and a lot of them were stitched with the motifs of the clans to remind the samurai of actually who they were they're not just you know farmers that they had codes of ethics and behaviour that they needed to follow. So there's a, Sashko developed in all different kinds of directions and for different historical reasons and it has different contexts in different areas. So I started becoming interested in all this when I got married and was travelling around Tohook a lot. And this is my husband's, my in-law's house. And in their house, the picture on the top, 
right hand side, that's the Hanafukin that I sat in the corner there for many, many years. And I guess it's one of the first examples of Sashko that caught my eye. And I started wondering what this was. And I don't know, there was something about these patterns that just spoke to me. I could stare at them for hours and hours. And it was quite strange because I'm actually not interested in handicrafts. <laughs> You know, I like beautiful things, but I really have no interest in handicrafts. But for some reason, these patterns just captured me. So I started taking notes of them over the years. And then I asked people what this was, and I, they'd tell me Sashko. And I started looking for Sashko in shops. I thought you'd find them in the souvenir shops where you'd find all the, you know, the rest of the lovely Japanese souvenirs. But I never saw Sashko, and I couldn't work it out. Why wouldn't you have this beautiful... <laughs> I shouldn't say when you have, and then I started to realize I think Sashko wasn't that mainstream, and a lot of people didn't know it, even Japanese, but they really didn't know what Sashko was. And I guess I had seen it because of traveling through Tohoku, but I certainly know a lot of people in this area who never saw actually saw Sashko in their daily life. I noticed kits about sometimes, so I started buying kits, and these were. Olympus kits and I do them every now and then and that's how I started uh, learning the names and I just take these out now and then and I do them and I didn't really know how to do Sashko. The pre-printed kits were fun to do but when I look at what I did now I don't consider that Sashko at all. It's, my stitching is just awful. I was cruising along and then until 2015 I had a really bad year and I was very ill and I had to stop work I couldn't do anything and during that time I picked up my Sashko kits and I started Sashko again and then I started doing more I started drawing my own designs and trying to find out more about Sashko and by this time there was things about Sashko on the internet and uh, more books that was the other thing I was always puzzled because there are so few books about Sashko in bookshops you can go into a bookshop and you'll find like this much of cross stitch and western embroidery and then there'll be about one or two books on Sashko even to this day it's always puzzled me why but it has started to change a lot anyway I decided two things after my experience of being ill in 2015 one life was too short and I was only going to do what I wanted to do so I decided to stop being commercial translator and I would concentrate on becoming or doing literary translation, which is what I really love doing most of all. And the other thing I decided was I realised that as a freelance translator, if you can't work, you have no income. And I thought, well, what can I do to make another source of income? And I thought, okay, I'll give a go trying to do something with Sashko. So that was one impetus for me, yeah, focusing my attention more on Sashko. But then, as fate would have it, I happened to meet a teacher. And I wasn't looking for a teacher. But the teacher just walked into my life. I happened to be walking past a, a gallery in a local train station. And a lady I know came out of the gallery and said, oh, Alison, come inside and have a look at our exhibition. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. And uh, I went in and it was an art exhibition, including all these Sashko pieces. And my eyes popped up. I couldn't believe it. it was just all oh, this gorgeous Sashko. And the Sashko teacher was there at the exhibition and so she said, why don't you join our Sashko class? So it was fate. <laughs> it was meant to be. So I joined the Sashko class. I started learning Sashko properly. And uh, that picture on the left is me with some of my classmates. Just, we'd meet once a month. And our teacher, Chiyoko Nakazaki, each month we would study a different pattern. She'd give us a, a template and we'd practice. We'd have to do the drafting ourselves. And then after, and take that home and make something with it. We never did much stitching in the class, so it was quite interesting. But in those classes, I learned a lot. My teacher, that's a picture of her on the right. And in the background is a couple of joint wall hangings that our group did. That's their snowflake patterns. So it's not traditional, but snowflakes are certainly used in traditional Japanese fabrics. And in Ibaraki, there's a famous daimyo who adopted the snowflake as his 
clan symbol and he was actually the first person to import a, a microscope into Japan from the Netherlands and published the first natural sciences book a study of 82 snowflakes so we did this snowflake hangings one year but Nakazaki sensei proved to be a fount of information because she studied under someone called Peter Eko who is one of the major figures in modern sashiko, in the revival of sashiko, I should say, as an art in Japan. So as I said before, sashiko has these origins as a practical craft for strengthening clothes, making bedding. And it was like that for a long time until in the late last century, Yoshida San Diego and Ginza Akie and there's a couple of other figures started taking up sashiko and doing it for, for aesthetic reasons. So Yoshida Eko was born in from Akita. She came from a kimono, a kimono shop family. And she had uh, this wonderful sense of style. She wrote lots and lots of books. Her programs were on NHK. Her books are still my favorite Sashiko books. Just an exquisite sense of style and taking all the old patterns and making them into something really m more modern and beautiful. So through my teacher Nakazaki Sensei, I learned about Yoshida Eko and I learned all kinds of snippets about Sashiko and its history and the Sashiko scene in Japan. So lots of things were coming together. And am I, is it all right, Mary? Not I was going to say, is this your obsessed part? Can I get this one? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering. Okay, here we go. I became obsessed with Sashiko, yes. <laughs> So there we are. That's what happened to me. In the middle, that's that's a runner, table runner I did. I loved drafting. I, I realised that drafting one is, was my most favourite part of Sashko. Drawing the patterns and, uh, and you can see in the memo, I've broken down how to draw a the hemp pattern. Nakazaki sense, say, sort of said, I remember her saying, like, every Japanese person knows how to draw asano ha. And I thought, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, but I always had a lot of trouble drawing it until I'd broken it down like this and could see where all the lines came. So when you draft a pattern and you see the structure and the composition and it just gives you a much, much deeper understanding of it and also the potential for it, you can, you know, by altering the dimensions, you can expand it or upways or lengthways or there are all sorts of variations possible. And um, Another factor that, that influenced me was this book, which I call my Sashka Bible, uh, Sashka no Kenkyu. And I learned about the existence of this book uh, in a lady's blog that I read in Japanese. And I started looking for it and it took quite a while. And eventually I found that it's written by a professor at Yonezawa University. And there's only a hundred of these books published and it's about this thick and it's just a fount of information about Sashko, really, really granular level. So believe me, Mary, you've heard nothing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, another thing I did was also I started a website because in my sort of Quest. To make a business from Sashko, I thought, well, I've got to have a website. And so um, I started the What's Sashko website, and that was a name that was thought up for me by Helen Iwata, one of our <laughs> colleagues mm. from the JAT. And I thought, that's great, What's Sashko? A lot of people ask, What's Sashko? Well, I can tell you What's Sashko. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm not very good with social media and stuff, so I wrote to Wendy into being my assistant and helping me get that sorted out and doing posts and things and I too have to say how much I appreciate the quiet power of Wendy and her dedication to handicraft <laughs> I couldn't have come this far without her encouragement and help and over time, I realized a couple of things. So in my quest to learn more about Sashko, I'd go to exhibitions, I'd read. Everywhere I went, I looked for Sashko, I talked to people. I started doing negotiating with Olympus to make my own kits because I realized one thing, that there was very little information in English about Sashko. And I thought, well, perhaps I can fill that gap. So the kits that I did, they were part of my attempt to fill the gap about how to do Sashko, which at the time there wasn't much information. The situation has changed a lot now. Sashko has 
boom <clears throat> around the world, mate, mm. compared to a few years ago, five, mm. ten years. It, incrementally, Sashko has boomed. So there is less need than there was like five or seven years ago for information in English. And I realized that I felt profoundly uncomfortable setting myself up as a Sashko teacher. I thought, that's not me, especially in Japan. Like, I love Sashko, I do Sashko, but I don't consider myself a model of Sashko <laughs> as a teacher. I would rather fill a different kind of niche. And I decided that I would use my skills as a translator to find out information, to tell people more about Sashko, its roots and origins. And, and that's something that I could perhaps do that nobody else, especially with my Bible. <laughs> yeah. So I started writing a blog and in preparation for this talk today, I went back and read all my blog posts and I realized I learned quite a lot actually about Sashko and yeah it's still a available resource for me I started reviewing books I started collecting Sashko books I have this huge collection of Sashko books <laughs> I can't resist a Sashko book every time I go past the bookstore I go in and see if there's a new Sashko book and that's also very interesting to see the trends in Sashko in contemporary Japan that are emerging because they are a little different to what's happening in the West. And I think there are different perceptions of Sashiko. So then, of course, I wanted to translate books about Sashiko. And so several years ago, I started asking agents that I knew. I said, do you want to sell any of these books? I, I'd find books I wanted to translate. And then I'd ask the agents, you know, how about trying to sell this book or whatever? And it was through the agents that I made contact with Terry Jaddick at Tuttle. And for quite a few years, we had an ongoing discussion about different Sashko books because she was watching the market and the trends in the US. And, and I, every now and then I'd say, oh, how about this book? Or how about this book? Or, and she was very cautious, but eventually the invisible mending and making boom has coincided with the boom in Sashko. And so eventually she said, let's do this book. So I was thrilled because this is one of the books that I'd done a review on and I really liked this Sashko artist. And I thought, She's, this is great. I want to translate this book. And I got the chance. So that was the first Sashko book that I translated. And then I just <coughs> finished translating another one. So it's not, that's the cover that's come out on, on Amazon. I, it's only, yeah, I only delivered the manuscript a few weeks ago. So it's still <laughs> in process. But this is really amazing, Sashko. This artist, I fish in, I, I love her work. I love seeing what she's done with the traditions of Sashko and how she's taking it, using those traditions and building on them in another way to make her own style of Sashko. So the title in, in Japanese is Sashko Modern Style 31, but in English they're calling it Amazing Sashko, which I think is great because it really is amazing. <laughs> so the, both those <clears throat> books I did book reviews on in my blog and with this one too, I'd done the book review and then... And I wrote to Terry Jaddick and I said, oh, I did this book review of this book. How about doing this one? And she wrote back and said, you know, I just bought the rights to it. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I know, it was another one of those you know, things like that were meant to be. So I translated that one as well. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. my Sashko story so far. <laughs> I told you guys that she was pretty passionate about this. <laughs> But that, that's kind of good because it brings us into the process that I want to ask both of you about. So I'm going to stop sharing this for a minute and ask, because I feel like Allison's is a truly Japanese handicraft. And Wendy's is, well, except for the Wazaka book, most of them are, most of the ones that I found on the Tuttle page are well-established crafts in other countries. So I wanted to ask the two of you, what's your basic process of translating these books? After you like have the contract and you got the book in hand, how do you attack it? And let me start with Wendy since we've heard from Allison okay. just now. Yeah, so I was thinking about how the process goes and my process has actually changed a bit. When I started, I'd be sent a PDF so I could see the book and then I'd be sent a separate Word file and then I'd just be working from complete text 
and just translating into the word file and it was quite difficult kind of juggling between the pdf and the word file and trying to match up the words with the pictures especially because i'll show you later with the wadaka if you don't have the pictures in front of you it can be very difficult to understand what's happening with the craft or what you're supposed to be doing so i came up probably with kind of my own process and some people might see it as a kind of nightmare but what I do is I get the PDF from a publisher and then I convert, I split the PDF into manageable chapters or sections. I then convert it in, into Word files. So then I've got a Word document that's easier to edit. But then, especially with a book size and to make sure that all of the techniques and everything, all the phrases are matching, I then put that into translation software. I personally use MemoQ, the reason being that it's still very open, that I can still put all my own translations in. And if I want to change a phrase, occasionally I can do. And then I just translate what I need to. The other thing I do is I buy the physical Japanese book as mm. well. So <clears throat> rather than looking on the screen, juggling between a PDF and mm. the text, I'm actually basically looking at the page in front mm. of me and then matching because it's mm. easier for me. And then probably the part that's a little bit controversial is I then I convert them back into Word files when I finished and then I format everything because with these kind of craft books that I'm doing, that's fine. Let's go for this one. Yeah, it's all laid out with the exact <clears throat> instruction for the for how you're supposed to be doing it. So I'm translating the text, but I'm also making sure that the design is matching too so that's kind of not quite my job mm. but because I have a perfectionist streak, <laughs> I want to make sure that everything is completely matching and lined up before I send the <coughs> it back it's a it's quite an involved process but I, for the most part I enjoy it so yeah that's how I work on those maybe in the end you're saving time by doing that then waiting until the publisher puts everything in the layout and then you have to look at it and say, no, 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 that goes here. Well, it's it's true. I've had very few questions back. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I do try to make sure that everything is in place and there's only occasionally they'll say, oh, you've missed this title here. Mm -hmm. And it's usually because when I've converted it across from the PDF, that image has just flown it's off somewhere more. and I've yeah. not been able to catch it. I want to yeah. show another page. I mean, you have to yeah. deal with like little word bubbles like that yes, and all yeah. of these steps. <laughs> yeah. And then Sometimes it's with the, crazy if you ask me. <laughs> yeah. Some of the word bubbles, they're actually pegs. So that oh. text doesn't get translated across. And depending on how the word file wants to play with me, it sometimes it won't let me overwrite. So I either have to put a text box in by myself and do it mm -hmm. or I have to take a screenshot of the pdf page and then put it into a powerpoint and mm -hmm. stick <laughs> text boxes over because yeah sometimes the pdf and the word files they don't play nicely but yeah there's there are ways around that it's, it's very guessing, technical but yeah I'm guessing some people are wondering is this kind of book a labor of love or is it I think so, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it sounds like a lot more time I than I Yeah, I think I like the balance between it's very arts and crafty, but it's also very technical. I think I've got both backgrounds for that. Yeah. I, well, I'm I, exhausted now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alison, do you do all that too? <laughs> no, and I think probably the editor knows that I am not as technologically accomplished as Wendy because I just get sent the word file <laughs> ah and, and the book right so you have the book and the word file. well I already have the book I, I sent the pdf and I already have the book but okay. yeah I don't use the pdf to translate I have the word file and then 
both write in the English and the Japanese. But that's also confusing because you, you really need to see the words in context to on the page to see mm. what they're referring to, mm. Mm. to choose the correct translation. So I, I always have the book open in front of me. So and I'm kind of going back and forth. Yeah, I'm looking at the book and then at the screen comparing them. So that's basically what I do. The last book I did was extremely text dense and very long. And I think to help me, they had taken out some repetitions, but sometimes I really needed those repetitions to understand mm -hmm. <laughs> what was going on. So yeah, that was quite a challenge. But I try to make sure that I'm using the same phrase. I go through and I do a first draft and then I go through and I do a check of everything. And in the check, I try to make sure that I'm using the same phrasing all the way through and being consistent. And I hope I am, but, you know, I'm not like Wendy. I don't have MemoQ or anything like that. <laughs> but, I, you know, I always say I'm happy to be asked questions, but I've never been asked questions about my translation. One area that I don't have a lot of confidence in is the sewing part. Because with Sashko books, it's not just the stitching, it's also instructions for sewing them up as well. And oh, into a bag or a, a bag, yeah. And, um, and, you know, of course I do my research, but I can't say that I'm always 100% confident that I've chosen the right word. And also because we're, Tuttle is an American publisher and, you know, I have an Australian, British, English background, mm, very different terms in use and sometimes you come across a stitch and it's you know a blind stitch I mean I've found about four or five translations for in Japanese it's koto, kotoji mm. and it's blind stitch ladder stitch or I don't know which one you choose so I just give all the possible variations and I let the editor choose the one that they oh, think that's... In, you know with their style how much time do both of you spend on making a couple of things I'm sure you don't make everything in the book I would be amazed if you do, but making a few things to figure out what they're actually saying. I don't take that long because the turnaround deadlines for me are usually about four weeks. Oh, so I, yeah. So it's, if I come across a technique that mm. I need to understand, then I'll make it. So for the origami, there was one fold that I just could not understand just by looking at it. So I actually had to get some paper out and practice it a few times and go, okay, that's mm. it. Yeah. And I think one of the crochet, I had to make the strawberry puff stitch because otherwise there was no way I was going to be able to get the exact mm. instructions for it, right? Mm. Otherwise, yeah, very little time for me. Yeah, I have a bit more lenient deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> but some things I spent an inordinate amount of time trying to replicate. For example, in the mending book, there was the little Omamori Bukuro. So I made the Mamori Bukuro, which the charm bags, which are very quick and easy to do. But when it comes to doing the knot that's on the bag, and the, what's the name? I can't remember the name of the knot, but it's, this is what she's talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That little knot. That's up not top. right up here. So that's I tried a nightmare to, to make. That's a nightmare. <laughs> I tried. But I've tried to follow the instructions in the book in the Japanese, and I, I could not do it. So I was going to YouTube and all sorts of places, trying to learn how to do that knot so that I could write about it correctly. That Saki Izuka's book, which is the author of Making and Mending, that was not too bad. Ayu Fisher's book, so Ayu Fish Int, the author of the amazing Sashko. Ayu Fish Int used to be a satellite engineer. She's got a very precise technical mind and her designs are like, obviously she's a whiz at drafting. And I can show you, this is one design that I made that's in her book. It's a Hitomezashi <laughs> stitch. And this design is called Kilim One. So Kilim is a kind of Turkish rug. So Aya Fisher's thing is that she loves textiles. And so she's trying to reproduce in Sashko a textural effect. So using color, but it's not just stitch, it's also the color. And she speaks about it in a very technical way, like sequences and intervals and things. And I just, I really could not grasp what these were until I actually did it for myself. But having 
after I made this, then understood how she uses her language to describe her pieces. And the other thing that she does is unique is that she has her own system for drawing up the designs and she makes templates. She has this special design template design board. Mm. So I've never seen this anyone else use before. This is her own creation, her invention. And so she gives instructions in her book how to make it. And, you know, you get the PPS sheet from the 100 yen store. You know, well, I went around looking. I couldn't find these sheets. I couldn't find the things that she <laughs> specified. So I thought I have to find something to, so I, you know, as a substitute that readers can use. In the end, I got a card case. <laughs> so this is how you have little card cases. Sometimes they're usually just about Meishi size or this oh. size. Well, this is like an A6 or something. It's just A6 size card case. And I, you know, I filed it with the nail clippers. I ruined nail clippers. I got sandpaper. <laughs> I got photo corners. And I used this to make the design for this on there and uh, draw it up. It was the, and that's the other thing with Ayu Fisher's pieces. So every work, this is a variation of Hanafukin. So the Hanafukin that I mentioned before, so in her book, she calls them cloth, which is a great translation, I think. And she uses the same size for every piece. So it's quite easy. You follow the instructions, you make up the cloth according to the instructions, and then you use this implement, this tool, and to draft the design onto the cloth, and then you start the stitching. So this is all something that's, it's not common. This is unique to her. So I felt that I needed to reproduce it to be able to do a good translation of that book. And Wendy, too, you were talking about like the materials in your books, even those are crafts that are done uh, in other countries. You had problems with the materials, too, right? Or finding them? Or yeah, it's because a lot of the craft books I'm doing, there's it kind of links again back with my licensing work. They're using brands. So they use the brand wool, they use the brand pencils, they use the brand paper, but of course it's all Japanese brands. And yeah, you wonder how you're supposed to work around that. But I found um, after a few times, I just put in the Japanese brand names and then the publisher will just put in a warning saying, you're probably going to need to find substitutes for uh -huh. all of these bits. These are all Japanese brands, but especially with the crochet and the felting the clover uh, clover is actually quite a well-known it's japanese brand but it's available in a lot of countries now mm -hmm. so for the yarn stuff it's a lot easier next we were going to talk about tricky sentences and terms but i think this was this was one of wendy's yeah <laughs> <laughs> do you want to explain this one <laughs> actually the strange thing, this is the pom-pom book. And the unusual thing about this is about one year before I translated the pom-pom book, I actually spotted it by myself and I got really excited because it looks so cute. And so I bought it for myself and I was like, oh, I really want to translate this, but there's probably no chance. This is my attempt at making the pom-poms in the book. You might be able to see on the <laughs> back book cover at the bottom, these are the nearly finished pom-poms and it's supposed to look like the black and white cat in the center oh. down there. <laughs> but what I want people to keep in mind is you don't have to be an expert crafter to be able to translate craft books. You need to have a love for the craft and you need to kind of know what the techniques are and how to explain them, but you don't have to be completely perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So <laughs> I'm sure we don't have enough time to cover everything. So I'll ask my speakers, would you rather go to tricky sentences and terms or talk about publishers? We go for tricky sentences. Okay, tricky things. This keeps changing. I guess that's one of the tricky things. Some of the words that I used to have to explain all the time, sashko, for example, I don't have to explain what sashko is anymore. And there are types of sashko like kuguri zashi or kitome zashi, which I used to have to explain all the time, but now they've become pretty well understood in the sashko world. I guess I find it hard when the word gets transferred to English and the meaning shifts. <laughs> So it's not the same as it is in Japanese. For example, borrow is one example of that. Borrow 
in English to me is not the same as borrow in Japanese. But you can't help that anymore. No, you can't help that. Mm -hmm. Hanafukin, that's something that I've struggled with for a long time. So this is one of the things about Sashko that really intrigued me. Like I showed you the examples of Hanafukin. And one of the interesting things about Sashko books is like practically every book is about templates for Hanafukin. Everything is about how to make Hanafukin. <laughs> That's how Sashko books are produced. All the publishers, they have books about Hanafukin. They keep coming out and out and out. And Hanafukin is like, there's something that have no function, no specific function in modern life. <laughs> so yeah. How do you translate Hanafukin? So that's why I'm really grateful to Ayufish Int for calling these cloth. I've seen a lot of translations for Hanafukin, including quilting, uh, dish towels. When you were explaining them, for them, for some reason came to me, it's kind of like what they would call a sampler. Sampler, you know. well, to me, no sampler is like something you stick on the wall, whereas Hanafukin are meant to be used, used. Okay. not just look at. So I think, yeah, cloth, I'm pretty confident that that will become the <laughs> fixed mm -hmm. translation. Other things, monozukuri, that, you know, I don't try and translate that a lot, but I do think that monozukuri and the concept of monozukuri is fundamental to Sashiko in Japan. Both Ayufish and Saki Izuka, they both say that monozukuri is the inspiration or the driving force behind their work. And I think that monozukuri is what makes Sashiko Sashiko. And not to be too rude, but I just think that monozukuri, the concept of like an artisan dedication to find quality, patience and skill, I really do think that that is fundamental to Sashiko. So that's something I have a hard time explaining. Also unshin. Unshin means a, a, a needlework, basically, is the translation for it. But it's more than just needlework. It's like how you hold the needle. It's how you do the threads. Mm -hmm. uh, how you do the stitches it's in sashko what makes sashko different to stitching in english say doing running stitches english is the way you hold the needle and the needle is held still and the cloth moves whereas in other kinds of sign you move the needle in and out and the cloth stays still so there's a fundamental difference there and that is part of the concept of unshin and talking about unshin so, so yes Unshin, Sashko Unshin is what makes Sashko Sashko. And that's another concept that's sort of, you can absorb it, but it's hard to say in a word. Wow. All right. Yeah. Okay. And pattern names, sorry. Come back. One more tricky term. Mm -hmm. Pattern names, because one, the patterns in Japanese have different names. So because all different regions have different names, yeah. for patterns. So that's really tricky to begin with. Then those pattern names have been translated into English, a lot of them. And I have to say there is one really influential book, the one in the middle, The Ultimate Sashko. That's by Susan Briscoe. Oh, and mm -hmm. she was somebody who came to Shonai, to Yuza in Shonai, as an English teacher first. And she was a quilter. So then she came back again some years later to actually study Sashko. And this book was the result of her time in Yuza. And it's probably the best book about Sashko in English and Japanese. It's a really brilliant resource. And she's incredibly influential in the Sashko English world. Mm -hmm. And I have immense respect for her and her work. But because there is this book, it's kind of like the go-to book for names. Mm. Sometimes when I translate, I try to keep the same names that are already in English. Like, yeah preserve that name but sometimes I look at a word and I think well I wouldn't really translate it like that but it's okay I could accept it and then very very occasionally I think mm, no and I use a different name and I always base those decisions I do a lot of research like the meaning of the kanji <laughs> I, I go to my Sashiko bible I go to the Japanese traditional design dictionaries I go to the kanji dictionaries and I do a lot of research first before I make a conscious decision to use a different name. So wow. Wow. that's how I come to that decision. Yes, I don't do it lightly. Otherwise, I try and keep to a standard vocabulary. Hmm. 
I want people to feel as confused as I did when I came across this. Yeah, I don't get so much tricky sentences. Again, like Alison, it's the terms and how to translate those terms across. And I always check if it's going to be more American English or more international generic rather than specific British or a specific region. But yeah, I thought this is the Wabaka book. And I just remember this particular item in the book of course for this one I wasn't the book wasn't there already there was a small pdf with very tiny images mm -hmm. so I had to kind of picture what this thing was <laughs> that mm -hmm. I was supposed to be writing about translating about so yeah you have the sentence the dose no ensui no naka ni ensui gata ni ano marita kanaame o irite ori so we know some cones and they're kind of weaved and yeah, they make really nice coffee. So yeah, this is definitely some kind of intricate thing for making coffee. Obviously, a lot of craft workmanship goes into it. If you go to the next slide, you will get to see what I really wanted to see. Ta-da! Ta yeah, I had a really tiny photo of that. So it was really difficult to tell what exactly the structure was going on with the two cones. But eventually, I managed to find a bigger picture. And then I realized, ah, it's a Kanami wire mesh coffee dripper. <laughs> so if we go to the next slides, mm -hmm. you'll see the final translation. <laughs> and this was just two sentences in the Japanese, but the first sentence I thought it needed breaking down a bit more. So you have the copper mesh woven into a cone shape is inserted into a solid copper cone and the unevenness of the mesh together with the heat retention of the copper plate makes coffee prepared in this dripper taste exquisite. <laughs> nice. You have to remember for this book particularly, it's not advertising the brands, but you're trying to showcase the workmanship and the brands. So you have to kind of sell it. And then you have the base of the dripper uses kikoami, tortoise shell style mesh so that it can be set on top of the cup or glass for easy use <laughs> and maybe some eagle-eyed translators will notice I actually missed out the doors and above more I missed out the more it should be the base of the dripper also uses kiko ami but um, yeah there's always a little thing that, if you, yeah if you didn't say that <laughs> yeah <laughs> we have a little message from someone at Tuttle so I'd like to read that out I'm to everyone because to hear it. I want to know it, what she said. <laughs> a lot of the books that both Wendy and Allison work on are published by P Total Publishing in Vermont, in the U.S. And so I wrote an email with a few questions to the person that both Wendy and Allison deal with, Terry Jadick. And these are the responses. And I think some of the responses will be helpful to people in this group that might be interested in starting translation on craft books. So my first question to her was, Tuttle has a wide range of Japanese handicraft books. So which crafts do you find sell well? And are there any current trends that can be seen? And Terry said, we're in an interesting position in that although we publish a number of craft and drawing books each season, we aren't an arts and craft publisher per se. Because those books have to fit within a broader profile, we don't have the same approach or resources as what I call full-on makers' presses. We tend to go with topics that have become perennial favorites. What sells best for us may differ from what sells best for mainstream craft publishers. So knitting and crochet, particularly those books that are primarily stitch dictionaries, sell well because they give needleworkers a foothold in a different method one which gives better access to Japanese knitwear, toys, and home goods designs. And the mending movement, which Alison mentioned, has resurrected sashiko as an art form here. Many who were introduced to sashiko via boro as a mending technique have come to appreciate sashiko in other ways and for other reasons. 
So from this, I'd love to expand into other Japanese embroidery forms. Needle felting also continues to sell well, especially with cute stuff like small animals being hard to resist, which is, I thought cute stuff wasn't that, that popular in the U.S., but I was wrong. And then I asked, how would a craft translator get a foot in the door with Tuttle? She says, drop us a line and let us know your areas of familiarity or interest. We publish books on needle crafts from knitting and crocheting to weaving, macrame, and dyeing, as well as kintsugi, origami, drawing manga, bonsai, and indoor gardening. And we hope to expand into other topics. And then she gave us this for some anecdotal background. I met Allison some years ago via email through our publisher. She shared some great insights about Sashiko and the lovely books Japan had to offer, but at the time, the topic was experiencing a lull in the market here, and our craft book profile was still becoming established, so we weren't best placed to do justice to the topic. As our presence in craft books grew stronger, it became possible for us to throw our hat into that ring. Allison's passion and expertise has become invaluable. Wendy was recommended to us by a fellow editor who has longer overall experience with Japanese books than the rest of us have. We've thrown all kinds of topics at her and she provides great work in all of them. <laughs> That's so cool. So both Allison and Wendy have been straightforward about which areas they feel comfortable with and which areas they feel less sure of. So when a translator is too far away from their subject, it tends to require research on their part, which of course requires time. They may find it impossible to gauge the amount of time they need to complete the project. So we appreciate it when a, a translator is upfront about what they are comfortable with. And finally, I asked her, what does she consider issues or stumbling blocks when it comes to publishing craft books from other languages? She says, I think that for any publisher, one of the biggest challenges is to find the books that can both sell well and fit the company's profile. The Asian author or Asian origin of a book may not be enough. With a handful of exceptions, the books that work best for a publisher like Tuttle are on an art or craft that a given country has either invented or is considered an expert in. Also, it's hard to know until you're in the thick of it whether there are cultural, practical, or even legal gaps that will have to be dealt with. This means adding or subtracting content sometimes both, while remaining as true as possible to the original. And that's about it. But that gives you a few hints about how you might want to go ahead. Don't take over Allison or Wendy's place, but you can go into a new little niche. <laughs> so I think I will stop our presentation for now and let people ask questions. Uh, can I just add the comment that she made about making sure that you're comfortable in the field that you translate? Definitely, she offered me a macrame book, and because I've tried doing macrame and I know I was absolutely useless at it, I just said, I'm really sorry, but that me and macrame just don't go. But you should be upfront and say, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to be able to, because otherwise you'll spend the whole time just researching and researching and you'll never actually get the book translated. So it's an important point. Right. Yeah. Good advice. There was a question up here for Alison. I think it was from Vicky. Do you want to ask it, Vicky? Okay. I'm just going to read out what I wrote, which maybe Alison hasn't read yet. But when you were talking earlier, Alison, about, well, I mean, that's where I probably got stuck. As an amateur, I thought that I had to keep the material still and move the needle. Mm -hmm. And as you got further into Sashiko, you realize that the traditional way to do it in Japan is to move the material, not the needle. Yeah. So my question to you, Alison, is can you tell by looking at a piece of Sashiko, whether it's done in the proper traditional Japanese way by holding the needle still and moving the material or in the amateurish way of moving the needle and keeping the material still pretty well yes you can tell right. yeah mm -hmm. and the reason is that when you hold the needle and you move the material you kind of fold it on the material more or less pleat it onto the needle mm -hmm. and then pull it through which results mm -hmm. in a straight line right so the size of the actual stitches may be more or less different, but it's generally in a straight line. 
So mm -hmm. that's one way you can tell. So if you're doing a running stitch, you'd go up, down, up, down, up, down. And mm -hmm. the stitches are kind of slightly off kilter. You can tell that they're done one by one. So that's one thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other giveaway is the edges where the stitches mm -hmm. intersect. So within Sashko, you know, there are sort of basic rules just to show you. This is Susan Briscoe's page, mm -hmm. what's right and what's wrong. So what you do when you come to a corner, like how the stitches intersect. So if you're doing that one, for example, you don't go over and cross. So the idea is to have the stitch size more or less the same length and you have a gap there, you know, bump up <laughs> against each other. So those are the kind of like really fine points that to me distinguish Sashko and <laughs> the sense of monozukuri <laughs> and, you know, the Japanese real sense of commitment to quality in Sashko. So it's just those fine points. And Sashko, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. I always call it like in perfect imperfection, <laughs> you know, <laughs> within a certain range. <laughs> It's got that sort of a hand stitch look about it, but within that, there are parameters that you try and keep. It's generally pretty obvious when you look at something. You told me how you found that beautiful Furoshiki. Mm. Do you want to sh have you got it to show people now? Oh, yeah, I do. Yes. I it's, told you. That's everything on people. hand. This yeah, is she's just, ready. <laughs> have a look at the stitching on this. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa, ooh, isn't ooh, this ooh, incredible? Ooh. And this is hand stitched. And there's no borders. Yeah, no borders. And this would be so, the stitching is the same length, it's even. What's even more incredible is that some years ago, a lady I know sent me this kinchaku bag with this pattern. And she said, you know, like my mother gave me this, but I don't really appreciate it. So I don't know anyone that would appreciate it more than you would. So she gave it to me and, and I showed it to my teacher and she was like, oh, that's amazing, you know, work incredible. You could take that to the Imperial Hotel. You wouldn't be embarrassed. <laughs> and then I got, then my friend sent along a coin purse as well. And so I had this kinchaku in the coin purse. And I've written a blog post actually about them. It's on my blog somewhere. Then a couple of months ago, I started looking at Merikari. And on Merikari, I don't know if everyone's familiar with Merikari, like the online flea market in Japan. And I saw this familiar pattern and I thought, oh my goodness, it can't be, it can't be. And it was that this, someone was selling this Furoshiki on Merikari and at this 3,000 yen and they said it you know like I was given it and I've got no idea what this is so I'm just putting it on Murakari so I like snapped it up and when it arrived you know I, I examined it closely and sure enough this is the same person it's the same artist absolutely yes. the same artist <laughs> as my kinchaku I don't know who it is <laughs> who is it? <laughs> <don't know> who <laughs> is. It's you, you can track that person down one day I'd love to know the story behind it all me yeah. too yeah. like yeah. who did this work I have a couple of questions one is to Wendy I want everybody to see this Wendy got this lovely blurb and uh, the wazaka yeah yeah this is on the wazaka book and this is yeah a blurb about her which is very rare that a translator unless you're really really well established literary translator you don't usually get even your name on the, the front cover how did that work and how can we get that for our work <laughs> yeah I don't know I think it's just because each book that you work on you have to remember that there is an actual artist behind it and they all have their different personalities and with Rinko Kimino, she's obviously she's got that kind of design in mind. I didn't ask for it. Oh, so you didn't? It just, so... No, it just happened that way. It's wow. as you mentioned, most of the time your name is not mentioned as a translator mm -hmm. because it's the artist and the work you're supposed to be looking at. So yeah, mm -hmm. most of the books, it's just a really tiny name translated by Yes, at the yes. back in the copyright section. You're established yourself, so I guess Susan Briscoe would, and I know that there's a famous knitter, Gail Rome, she does a lot of the Japanese knitting stitches, so her name goes on the front because, of course, it will sell the book more, but otherwise, <clears throat> it's very much, you're supposed to be looking at the work and 
yeah, just focusing on that, not the fact it's translated. I mean, I can understand that if it's just instructions, then mm. yeah, maybe that's okay. But with this Wazaka book, I feel that's like true. it has to be written so beautifully mm. because you have to put in a certain number of Japanese words as is in Romaji yeah. to let them know what you're talking about. So mm. if it's not a really well-crafted English paragraph, nobody's yeah. going to read it. So I, you I deserve think... it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah, that one is the craft book, but it's not a how-to craft right. book it's very right. much it's it's showcasing the products so right. yeah that's probably another reason why I got the blurb so yeah it was nice to have so. I would like to say in this book as you can tell I'm very into tenigui this is my fall display and uh, this book usually has two pages per craft like a nice nice photo and then the explanation tenigui gets six pages so I really recommend you buy this book if you like it <laughs> I would just like to pipe up and and encourage everyone to get their name on their book, especially when they're translating about Japanese culture mm -hmm. and interpreting, especially if you have to do kind of writing related tasks as part of your translation, it's creative. You know, you're not just a machine. And even, you know, even in literature now, they're really trying to get people to have their names on translations. And I think I have been fortunate to have my name on translations about, for example, Minka and other topics relating to Japanese culture. And it might not be on the cover, it might only be on the copyright page, but mm. someone is going to look, who translated this? Because it's good. Or if you don't do a good job, <laughs> or if they screw it up at the publisher, then you want to make sure it's not there. <laughs> Right, yeah. But I think we should make an effort to get our names out and be recognized because it's not just left to right. Um, I agree. Yeah. Uh, working with publishers, I wanted to ask both of you, I, I kind of know a little bit more about Al how Allison does it, but do you find the publisher or do you find a book and like you have a book you love and then you look around for a publisher or how do publishers find you? Any advice in that way for some of the audience here? Start with Alison. Well, I have been trying to push Sashko books for years. So one of my tactics is I write reviews on my blog about books that I'd like to translate, mm. but it's easier to go through agents. If you know any agents, so that's how I got my introduction to Terry Jack. And periodically I ask the agents I know, like literary agents. So, you know, how about, trying to sell this book I, I've given lists of books I'd love to translate to agents it never <laughs> hardly ever works out but you know cast a wide net and eventually you might snag something that's <laughs> my policy yeah so I've tried a lot but okay. these two are the only two that have all right Wendy how do you go about it or I'm actually very passive as I pointed out to begin with I have the three fields and this is actually supposed to be my smallest field so it's kind of crept up on I think I've got like 12 or 13 books I've published now that's a lot that that's I translate nice. yeah and I've, it's kind of surprised myself I have a whole shelf but it's all just kind of trickled in and it's mostly because of the contacts I've had through sweat Yay. and the mentions <laughs> it takes time as well so the pom-pom book after I translated it I think it was like a two-year gap and then people noticed oh Wendy's name's at the back of this book okay let's ask her to do this and then it's just the case in this one where I just watch out for things. I do occasionally, if I see a really great, especially crochet books, I do recommend them sometimes. So if I have, not as enthusiastic as Alison, but the crochet and knitting books, if I spot some that I really like, I will ask, are you interested in publishing these? Mm -hmm. But I find you have to get books that are going to go over into the Western market. Mm. So a lot of, there's the amigurumi for crochet that's really, really popular. But if it's too Japanese, there's no way that you can find a market for it. So you have to get the balance. So I remember this really beautiful, like Christmas, New Year crochet book. But the problem was that all of the New Year decorations were very, very Japanese. Yeah, yeah. And the yeah, the publisher just had to say it's great, but there's no way that that it's going to create enough interest 
for everybody you, yeah. you're having to think about all the readers who are going to do that craft right. so you have to get something that is slightly generic mm -hmm. that's going to translate across completely that everyone can feel they're going to do or at least mm -hmm. going to make at least one or two of the pieces in there it has to be able to sell it has know? to sell that's, yeah that's the point yeah yeah I was surprised that there's a book on King Siggy King Siggy it's, it's gone crazy it, <laughs> yeah. and I think it's all because of that what is it the meme of Japanese people they keep gold dust in the house and always fill <laughs> their plates with <laughs> It's and gone. we all drink <laughs> mugs for breakfast too. Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer just po uh, post. I think a lot of you know this one. She says thank you to everyone for today's talk. I have a book recommendation, and it is the quick guide to traditional Japanese arts and handicrafts. Kyogen Jiten, gonna. And of course, I think maybe at least half of us know who is written and translated by Catherine Nakamichi. Cat Nakamichi. And anyway, she's put in the name there and a link to it. You might be interested in. It's already on my shelf, so yeah, I, I have it on my shelf too. Yeah. <laughs> Does it have such a in several... it? <laughs> oh, good several... question. Because yeah, I, I think, think I several asked versions now, isn't there? I think yeah. Uh, yeah, there's two or three editions. Going. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Didn't yeah. know. so there's. It, I'm, I presume that Sashiko is in there. So. Oh, and Lynn just posted something about a talk that Catherine Nakamichi gave about the book. So she, she was on the talk shop a year ago, uh, two years ago, among the Kansai folks who did a, a talk with us. So she talks about that book, the experience in that. Okay. All right. I have two questions. One is, do you ever like debate about how much romaji you're going to use in a book? And I think maybe part of this is especially for Allison. Actually, also in, in the Wazaka book, do you mention the Japanese name of something like the coffee? What was it? Coffee dripper. Mm -hmm. Or mention it in Japanese once using the romaji and then go into English all the way? Or do you try to keep the Japanese word in there? And I asked this because I saw a presentation on yokai and they made a point of saying yokai are totally Japanese so you just go with the names of the yokai most of the time because that's what they are they have never been called anything else in English how do you make the decision of how much Japanese to use well it's not really my decision to make <laughs> it's the publishers though. but I was pleased to see a Tushul published another book a Nihon Vogue book and it was a translation of a book of templates of Hannah Hanafukin mm -hmm. <laughs> patterns and I think there's a total of about 30 different patterns in there and I was really interested to see that they were using the Japanese names and oh, then they have the English in brackets so I thought yeah. well that's good so I use that as a kind of model for when I translate my book the, mm -hmm. the I Ofishin Saki Izuka's book yeah I follow that's that cool. and I totally understand yeah that you know there are some things that are so Japanese there are no English equivalents and yes. you yeah. can bend over backwards to try and slate them and you won't manage to convey and I think mm -hmm. in general there is a trend towards becoming more accepted of you know different foreign yeah. words in the English language and people can just google anything they don't know these yeah. yeah it just makes it a lot easier the only problem is I watched a couple of YouTube things on sashiko and the people that i saw they called it sashiko and i yeah. honestly in the beginning didn't know what they were saying sashiko and i was a little <laughs> bit confused that's but. an interesting thing too so that's like american pronunciation yes yeah, they were american definitely yeah yeah so how about you wendy do you have to debate about this in your mind a little bit but i think i've landed on that i use the japanese and then the English translation straight after, and then just refer to it to the Japanese after that. And then mm. if there's a slight vagueness, I'll put hints in the English as to the shape and form or whatever it Got is. It. Okay, I just have one last slide to show you. Hold on a second. Go up here. I asked both of these lovely speakers books I want to translate. And I didn't answer. <laughs> Yes, you did. Actually, you did. You did. Maybe did. you didn't need to, but you did. But first, I'll show you Allison's answer is many. <laughs> <laughs> top of my list. <laughs> this is the top, top yeah. of my list. 
So the one on the far left, that's Kashkono mm-hmm. Kuromono by Yoshida Eko. That's a really old book and the publisher doesn't exist anymore, but it doesn't matter how much time goes by. Those patterns are just timeless and really beautiful. And I just I would love to translate them. The middle one, this is an amazing book. So like a bride's <laughs> trousseau. So the, the author of this book, in uh, this lady in Hiroko Kondo in Akita, she went round to all the farmhouses and all the backwoods areas of Akita, gathering up all these patterns, that traditional patterns. Wow. And, you know, she wouldn't, uh, she couldn't like take photos or do the designs. She'd sit down with them and stitch the patterns and kind of memorize that. And then she put them all into this book and made this book. And when you see, when I read, saw this book first, there were patterns I'd never, ever seen in there. They're just stunning. And I think it's an art book. It's so beautiful. And um, I'd love to translate that one. And then the one on the far right, that's Nihon Bungesha book, Dento um, Gara de Tadoshibu uh, Fukinto Komono. It's a beautiful mixture of like really traditional sashiko, the, the blue and white, but with kind of modern twists and very stylish and chic and I just think that's a, a, a gorgeous book that I would love mm-hmm. to translate I I get to. Would like to. <laughs> yeah. so Tuttle knows all about these that you're waiting for the contract <laughs> yes <laughs> all right yeah well actually yeah I think Wendy what I got from an email from you when I asked you guys this question was anything that comes my way kind of answer <laughs> is that right yeah because that, that's the way it works with me I just yeah I just flow along and if something comes and it looks interesting I'll go okay yeah so <laughs> well, as long I'm as I'm gonna, confident as long, right as long as you can kind of make one of them so yeah. I kind of want to end with this one quote I haven't asked Alison if it's okay to read this or not but it's a little box I found in this book oh okay yeah and I don't know I, I'm not a great stitcher but I kind of like to stitch and I read this this morning I got a little bit more I don't know enthusiastic about stitching some more the little box this is by the author of this book but Allison's translation the box title is enjoy Sashko in your daily life it's satisfying to make with your own hands the things you need or find useful and when you do it with Sashiko you'll find your affection for the item growing with every stitch oh it's so and true isn't it? Needlework also has soothing effect on the mind and body rhythms. I think that's kind of cool. I, I think that it applies to not just Sashko. I think yeah. things that you make and spend time making. Oh, what's this, Wendy? Oh, Wendy. I'm, I'm making a jumper because it's going to get cold and expensive here in the UK. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's very mindful working with your hands so right right yeah there's machine ninaru <laughs> wait wait vicky just hold yours up vicky you're, you're yeah, making hands working on something too. crochet ah, has been wave pattern crochet beautiful. i love it mm. it's yeah. gorgeous yeah of course wendy's now living in the same town and what is it a couple of doors away from a very famous crochet yandale Yes, mm. next weekend I will be at ah. a yarn festival that happens for the whole weekend. So next weekend, um, mm. it's just basically 20 minutes walk up the road. So next oh. weekend I'll be learning how to spin wool and also Ooh. how to knit brioche, which I've never been able to do before. Ooh. And hopefully I won't uh, I won't bankrupt myself by buying <laughs> <laughs> lots of wool. <laughs> I think we should all go out and buy at least one of Alison's Wendy's book so she can afford all the things <laughs> she does to create these books. Well, actually, when did you get royalties? Yeah, oh, darn. Oh, yeah, that's I don't know. But don't get royalties. Yeah, yeah. you don't get royalties. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we don't make anything on the sales of promoting the books we've translated. <laughs> uh, we need to buy your creations. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't sell. So. Anyway, you can support us by. <laughs> hey, Alison, do you yeah. have to write your own book? Oh, mm-hmm. what about Sashko? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all the I history wish- you've given us today and, and how useful Sashko mm. has been over hundreds of years, pretty amazing. Mm. It is amazing. I think it's a really in- incredible story. And mm. that's why people like Saki Hizuka, whose book I translated, Mending and Making Sashko, mm. what she's doing is she's the living embodiment of like the 
Sasuke's origins, you know, she lives in Gumma. She doesn't ever throw away fabric. You know, she mm-hmm. really makes and mends and uses everything and lives a self-sustainable lifestyle. So, wow. yeah. yeah, there's so many interesting people doing If you something. do write a book, though, you have fans. Daniel, Daniel Morales says, part mem- memoir, part instruction. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'll think about it. <laughs> Yeah, Alice and I was thinking exactly the same thing when you were talking. You've just got such a breadth and depth of knowledge of the field. You know, where else is that in English? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I thank you. <laughs> you planted a seed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would just like to add that I also sew as a means of getting away from the display. Mm-hmm. And it is, as Alison and Wendy said, it's very good for the brain yeah um, when you're translating and writing or doing word work not as somebody said but that's really true yeah um, and it rests you it gives you a chance to reset mm-hmm. yeah which i think is really valuable it does mm-hmm. yeah rejuvenate since i was the one who first approached allison and then wendy to organize today's session i would really like to thank them and especially to marion for coming on as moderator and working with allison and wendy to make this day possible and to have this occasion for sweat to listen to our members who are talking about their work right down to the details of words and phrases and the specifics of what we do in their particular field of expertise and Mm -hmm. I would like to have more events like this from other members who are working in different niches. And we need all of your help in tapping our members and others who are maybe not members to continue Mm -hmm. these kinds of dialogues about WordCraft in our various manifestations because there's so many different interesting fields of our work. And I hope that we can do more sessions like this. Thank you so much, all of you. It was so difficult, right, ladies? <laughs> <laughs> it might have been difficult for you, but it was a pleasure for me. Oh, Absolutely. it was fun. <laughs> I really, I don't get the chance to talk about Sashko to people, except, you know, like my friends, and I know I bore their ears off. <laughs> <laughs> it was really great. Yeah. yeah, it was fun. And it was a good experience for us. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>